House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and of course, I'm Al Warren, sitting there back from his uh, his serious operation. We've got Mr. David Martino. Hey, Al, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Are you sitting? <laughs> <laughs> I'm officially old now. Yeah, you're officially yeah. old. Officially yeah, you old. Could, you got to look forward to that for every two years now. Yes, I know. You know, crazy. Yeah, you get like me. I get in the doctor's office. I just take off my pants. <laughs> now you know I haven't seen my 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 doctor for years because he always has someone stand in now. <laughs> Can't take it. Well, we got we got an excellent show today. We've got a couple of guests, um, uh, both from uh, over the uh, the pond way, I guess we say it. So uh, mm-hmm. let's introduce them. So what we've got is we've got uh, Mr. Howard Linsky, of course. Hi there, mate. Good to hear from you again. Yeah, it's good to have you back. You yeah, know, let's get stuck on the show. Yeah, it's amazing you're still made it after that last party you were at. But yeah, yes, I'm still alive. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I survived the weekend drinking in Harrogate. Yeah, with a lot of alcohol. yeah. <laughs> I yeah, I thought you were just like a really nice, quiet, personable boy. I was surprised. Yeah, that's the image. But I'm afraid that collapses <laughs> every every few months when you see me at festivals drinking with other crime writers. So yeah, animal. Yeah, animal. <laughs> now, uh, now we're going to be talking about a book, uh, Protecting Diana. It's a bodyguard story, and we've got the um, the person who the story's about there. So we've got Mr. Lee Sansom. So thank you for being here, Lee. Al, thank you so much for having me on the uh, on the podcast, and it's a, a real pleasure to be here with you, uh, with Howard. Of course, the the first question that comes to mind is how the two of you uh, got together on this. Like, what what? How did you meet Howard? So, Al, this is a really interesting story. Um, so, over quite a few years, I've been asked to write a book, and uh, and probably about I don't know eight nine years ago, I started to go into writing a book with a ghostwriter, and uh, and it just wasn't the right time. I couldn't commit, and I and I and I backed off from 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 doing a book, and then I. Uh, just before COVID, I looked at it again with a with a, a guy who said he could write it for me, a ghostwriter. So, so he told me he was, and I had a terrible time with this guy. Uh, and it ended up he was writing things that I didn't really want him to write. I didn't feel that that, that connection with him, and and I was it, it was driving me mad. What was supposed to be an ex, you know a really enjoyable thing to write a book about my life was was turning into a bit of a, a high pressure nightmare. So, um, a friend of mine um, had wrote a book in the UK, and his ghostwriter was Howard. And I, and I said to him, look, you know, could you hook me up with the Howard? I just need to pick his brains to see what to do. So, luckily, Howard um, said, you know, call me. I called Howard, and I spoke to him, and then Howard... Yeah, I, I would say, within about 40 minutes... Um... I was just so knocked out by Lee's life. Um, I thought it was so fascinating. And um, I think initially we were talking about, uh, Lee was basically asking advice on how to get a book together, possibly even to write a bit of fiction based on his life. And I, I just phoned in on some of the things he was telling me, going, well, why don't you write your life story first? And um, it was a bit like a bit of a courtship thing. I thought I didn't really want to come right out and say, oh, I'd like to write it. But um, I, it was already at the back of my mind, this would be a great interesting story because Lee has been a bodyguard to some very, very top people, including Princess Diana, obviously, who we knew well, and um, his life before and after that was fascinating too, and uh, I had a literary agent, obviously, because I've written a lot of fiction and non-fiction, and I, I wrote some notes on Lee's life and ran it by my agent, and he was excited by it too, and we, um, we decided we'd give it a go and start writing um, the outline to see if we could get a publisher interested. And, um, yeah, uh, that's what we did, and um, needless to say, we, we did get a publisher interested, and we got Divergent Books in the US and Orion in the UK, both of whom thought Lee's life was absolutely fascinating. So we've ended up with a deal on both sides of the Atlantic, which is... So how did you guys decide um, on which stories you're going to tell about who you protected and about 
the parts of light your life. And I, and I guess we can start, of course, Diana is obvious, but with some of the others, um, we'll start with Lee. So I got chatting to Howard, Al, and, uh, and I've done quite a lot of different things in my life. And, um, and it's not until you start speaking to somebody else about it and they, and they say, well, you did this and then you did that. And, and hang on, we'll stop. Let's just, you went there, you did this, you did that. Wow, okay. So as I'm speaking to Howard about, you know, what, what we could put in the book, it became apparent that there was quite a lot. And then it was down to Howard then to kind of manage it. So um, as we uh, as we got through, we'd go down a, a you know, a rabbit hole and we'd, we'd create a story. And, and then in the end, the book just kept growing and growing. Hey, Howard. Oh God, yeah. So we had uh, we had enough for two books, probably even three. I would say. I mean, um, I felt quite guilty, Al, at times because I'd be thinking I'd, I'd written down notes on lots of these stories, and sometimes I'd be thinking that's a good story, but it's maybe not as good as that one, so we need to leave it out. Even uh, I mean, Lee worked undercover in Northern Ireland during the height of the troubles in the eighties, and we ended up with four or five chapters just on that because the stories were incredible, um, and there were five. St- five chapters on Diana and William and Harry, um, and, and some of it was fun stuff, some of it was quite dramatic stuff. Um, and, you know, he's, Lee has led a fascinating life. And so my job was really to put a bit of structure on it and a bit of, um, you know, narrative. So you start, you don't necessarily start at the beginning of the person's life. You start at the most interesting part, in my opinion. But I did go a bit back and forth, and part of it was putting some structure in and having chapters on different parts of his life. And uh, really what we had to do then was focus on the interview side of things and say, right, tomorrow we'll speak and we'll do an hour and we'll talk about just this one thing, the, the, what you did in Libya or what happened to you in Somalia or what happened to you when you met Diana. And then we would just focus on that and try and, try and not diverge off all over the place. And if you do that well, long enough and often enough, you end up with a book. You've got to be yeah. quite disciplined, I think. And thankfully, Lee was a pleasure to work with, so... He kept on track, too. It, it must have, you know, um, Howard, it must have made you feel like you lived a boring life, right? <laughs> immensely, mate, immensely. I, I don't know about you, but I'm always interested in and impressed by things that I absolutely cannot do. So I'm the opposite of a hard guy. I certainly am not a bodyguard or anybody who would cope with the military. I'd last about 24 hours in the military before they... They realised I'd be unfit for service, and they'd kick me out. <laughs> you couldn't even be a cook. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know that one. But Lee, what made you um, actually want to write the book? Like, was there a per- particular reason that you wanted your story to be out there? Yes. Um, I say we were just going into lockdown, and I was going through a change in my career, and, and it was going from being an operator... Uh, actually doing things to, to more um, looking after contracts and getting involved at that level. And and I kind of thought, yeah, it, it's the right time to to have a look at, you know, writing this. And my main focus really was to leave something for my for my children to, to read, uh, almost a legacy, almost, but um, just, just something that I could have down that, that in later life they'd, they'd have a reference to to, to me, so uh, that was my driving force really. And then as we got going um, with Howard and it, I mean we've never met as well, Al. We've done this all virtually, so we've never actually met. But I feel like I know Howard so well, and it's that like kind of crazy that I know he knows my life so well, which is a bit freaky. Uh, because of COVID, we never even got the chance. So we we live quite a long way away. Not by U.S. standards, but by British standards, we're at opposite ends of the country. <laughs> and uh, with COVID, we, you know, there, there was there was restrictions, and so we used to do this. We we do stuff on the phone, or we would get. Uh, so I put I put the phone on speaker, and I'd ask a few questions, a bit like a journalist, I suppose, and um, just try and you know coax all the details of the stories out. And then at the end of a session, I'd go away and turn that into a chapter. And, and we kept going for several months until it was done. But, yeah, I, I do feel like I believe very well. But we're going to try and meet up in Scotland. We are. Um, in, in... Hopefully, finally. And uh, I suspect there'll be quite a lot of beer that will be drunk. <laughs> 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 to, 
who had to celebrate this book in his life and just finally meet this fellow who I know so well, but have never actually met. So, yeah, we're looking well, forward to that. Be good. No, it's a good, it's a good thing. Now, it, it, and this one can go to both, but we'll start with Lee, actually. Uh, out of all the uh, people you've um, met and, and protected and worked with throughout your life, and in the book, of course, um, who was the most memorable uh, for you? I, th- I think it's got to be the princess at that at that time, Howard. I mean, she was the most famous person on the planet. Absolutely. And a lot of people who weren't alive at that time or, or didn't remember, it was almost like JFK again repeated, you know, obviously, you know, the tragedy when she died. But uh, I think it's got to be Diana, really, because... Because of who she was, and, and I wasn't usually um, overwhelmed, and I wasn't even I wasn't overwhelmed by her. But because she, who she was, and I knew I had a really important part to play in this jigsaw puzzle of security and what, everything that was going on. Uh, but also, that holiday that we had was very challenging for, but for me in a, the role of a close protection operator, it was a great challenge. It was really hard. It was difficult. Lots of challenges, but, but you know, I, I just love being on that cutting edge of stuff. And that's probably why I've done as many uh, things as I've done. I just like that challenge of this has never been done before, or this is dangerous, or this is uh, going to be a lot of pressure. So that uh, that holiday with, with, with the princess, I think we learned a lot of lessons, which I've, I've uh, been able to, to teach, uh, you know, and, and I still do teach in, in the security industry. But I think her for being a wonderful woman and a beautiful lady uh, inside and out and with those lovely children, that was probably my, you know, the highlight of my career, I would say. Oh, and so, Howard, what, do you, what did you feel like when you were uh, taking all these stories down? Was, was Diana the kind of the one that stuck out the most for you? It did. I mean, Lee, Lee's had some amazing, um, I suppose adventure sounds almost like a trivial word, but he's had lots of incidents in his life where I think, my God, we're lucky he's still with us. You know, he, he could have been, easily he could have been killed in, in several different um, incidents in several different countries. But the more I learned about the time he had with Diana, the more I realized it was quite a pivotal time for him. So it was very key to his story. But also she is a, a, a person who fascinates us still, and it's the 25th anniversary of her death this year. And, and, and you know, I remember it. Vividly, I think we all remember where we were when we heard that she'd been killed in, in, in Paris. So it resonates with people. People can't quite believe how many years have gone by since, since she died. And uh, the stories that Lee had, unlike most people, he was you know, close and quite personal and was able to talk to her every morning before they went out on the beach in the holiday. He mentioned at San Tropez because he was, he was with Dodi Fayed at the time, who Lee was um, working for, and Al Fayed. Um, and he got to know her really well and quite close to ultimately the tragic accident in Paris. I mean, if it hadn't been for the uh, vagaries of a roster, um, Lee could have been in that car. And his friend Trevor Reese Jones was in the car instead, and Trevor was the only survivor of the crash. So, you know, I think in many ways it was a sliding doors moment for Lee and a fascinating story. And his life went off in a different direction because he probably would have gone to the US because Diana was definitely going to go out there with Dodie and uh, Lee had been asked to join them, and uh, it never happened. Lee, how do you remember that? Like, um, when um, when the accident happened, of course, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are going to ask you about that, um, and kind of what your opinion of, of, of what happened that day. Um, do, do you have any, any opinions or ideas or thoughts that you want to share with people? Yeah, it's... Uh... If you look at it, Al, there's been so many things written about the incident and and all the various um, anomalies and and things that went on. And, and we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. And I'm no expert in it at all. And I don't study this this piece at all. But um, you know, I spoke to, with Howard about this at great length. And and what happened inside that tunnel? Obviously, we, we'll never know. But uh, I, I think that the, the the security services at that time who were who, who were present were, were probably in the tunnel at the time and just got caught up in an accident, and it, it set in in motion 
a catalogue of things to try and deny that they were there, obviously for security reasons, I, I, I do get that. But I think that's just led to things happening in and around the tunnel and the incident, which, which raises a lot of questions. And I, and I think it was, it was just a mistake that, that the security services were in the tunnel at the time and they, and they just had to deny that they were there. And I think that's where the issue of, of various things that went Went, went wrong on the night and I think it, it was just a, it was just a horrible accident that just went horribly wrong yeah do you know you what mean? Al as well when I, when I interviewed yeah. Lee about this I was fascinated to see what he was going to tell me because there seems to always be two schools of thought in this either people say well it was just an accident or they say oh she was assassinated by some dark forces now that's a bit of a conspiracy theory but it doesn't always explain if you think it was just an accident as to why certain things were covered up later um, and why Henri Paul was blamed for having drunk a lot when clearly Lee's colleague, um, Trevor East Jones, would not have allowed a drunk man to drive Princess Doherty and himself, so that would never have happened. Now, if you think that the security services were in the tunnel, um, as Lee maintains they were, because there were people on high-powered motorbikes who went through at the same time as the car, if they witnessed the accident and their reaction was horror and they thought, oh my goodness, we have to... We cannot be here. We cannot be seen to be here. Therefore, we need to blame the accident on someone else. Um, therefore, possibly a drunk driver, uh, as in Henri Paul. Then um, that explains a lot of what followed, where there were blood samples that were discredited later that claimed that Paul had been drinking. And, um, you know, it, it Lee's explanation to me is the most plausible one for what happened. It was probably an accident, but it had to be deniable that the security services were there. So anything that followed that was hard to explain or looks like a conspiracy was for that reason they just couldn't be there and they had to blame somebody else you mean to tell me the queen's not a lizard and she didn't do this we had a whole chapter on that but the lawyer's got a bit sniffy with us so we have to take that out <laughs> well now i now i've just shattered my dream my god now what am i going to do ah well, uh, but you, you, so you you were really fascinated with Diana, like she was a, as real a person when you knew her live and and interacted with her as what we would see on TV. Then, yeah, exactly. It's difficult, you know. And I've spoken to a lot of journalists and a lot of uh, paparazzi who have an opinion on Diana. They've never even met the lady. It seems that you know once it's written, it's gospel. Um, but. Um, I, I knew her as, as, as somebody who had no agenda whatsoever. I, you know, I was I was uh, working for Mohammed Al Fayed. I was part of his security team. I've been with him for years, and we had this guest. You know, and, and I started, you know, we looking after her and the boys, and so I had really no agenda and, and no opinion on on the, on this guest. Uh, it happened to be the princess and, and, her, and her sons. But, but pretty soon, it, it became apparent that she was an amazing mother and a lovely person. And, and she had plenty of time to voice various opinions or, or, of various things. And she never did. She was just consistently a lovely lady who cared about other people. And you could see how, you know, she, you know the way she spoke to the, the cleaners and the cooks or anybody, you know, she'd say hello to and thank you. And it just, you just thought, you know, th this lady is getting a really hard time from the press here. And the things that they were writing about, I thought, it just doesn't seem right. It didn't add up. Does that make sense, Al? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. And, that, and that's me with no agenda. Uh, and, you, you know, the media at that time, uh, even the paparazzi at that time, if they got a, a snap of Diana, what they would do, they would dock to the picture, and we've seen it, and they could do it at the time, but they, they, they would sell for a, a million euros, these top, uh, so there's a lot at stake uh, at that time. It's a very, very challenging and diff difficult time, you know. Also, it struck me, she wrote Lee a lovely letter after this holiday, which she, oh, you know, like a thank you letter, that not only um, was thanks for looking after me, but was an acknowledgement that his life would have been a lot harder with her than it would have been normally had he just been looking after the Al-Fayeds. And she, got, she signed it and got um, William and Harry to sign it on him as well. And I've seen this letter and it's lovely. And uh, she took the trouble to do that, you know. Yeah. Was there, you know, ask the bodyguard too, ask that. Was there a, a lot of attempts 
on Diana's life um, that you're aware of? Um, I'll know. I know she had stalkers, um, as all as all the, you know high profile people do. So she did have she did have threats on you know on her. Uh, so, but also I think she was concerned, and and it, and it was well publicised. She was concerned about threats just generally against her because she was going against the system. So, you know, um, I, I think she had, uh, she had, you could call it healthy paranoia or you could call it paranoia, but she did have um, her own issues about uh, external threats to her, yeah. The, uh, the shooting of Gianni Versace, which we cover in the book, happened around about that time, just before Diana was killed, and... Uh... Lee, you bumped into her, didn't you, on the boat at the Jonicle, Um and she was in tears and was was worried about her own future as well as mourning her friend, if I remember rightly. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and and, uh, and I had quite a an interesting you know conversation with her, where she uh, she asked me, did, did you think that they were going to kill her? And and by they, I I took it to be you know the, the some kind of. Uh, uh, as you might call secret service type outfit, but um, yeah, so she, she was very concerned about how this was all going to work out, and I think at that time as well, uh, that the press were just hounding her. She couldn't do anything right in in the West, in the States. They loved her there. The press there she got was just probably befitting who she was and, and what she was trying to do with the various uh, things she was doing. Um, you know, with landmines and she, and she, you know, the 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 causes that she helped, uh, some were quite controversial. So yeah, I should imagine she had a lot going on, and probably not a lot of people to turn to to talk to. To be quite honest. Well, Lee, you know, I'm wondering, what is it like being um, a close protection specialist day to day? Um, you know, is it is it more in the planning? Is what I've read. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's um, a lot. A lot of people don't understand that uh, it's the, the planning phase of all close protection operate, uh, operations is, is is where you win and lose. And sometimes, yeah, I've been in I've been in operations where you, you just can't do it. You 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 just functioning because everything's coming that fast you haven't got time to prepare you haven't time to plan and that's where you draw on the, on the experience of the team and obviously the team leader um but um yeah the planning phases for some operations are you know they take so much time especially in hostile environments and then also you, you can go on operations where it's mission critical and you've just got to get out and do it uh, and they can be challenges as well, where you're just making dynamic risk assessment after dynamic risk assessment. But I think the big, the big, um, the big pressure on on the bodyguard or, or the, the team, the leader of the team, really, is when to when to say stop. And that's 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 a real responsibility because if you get it wrong, you can lose your job. Uh, if you get it if you get it right, nobody sees you save the day because mm -hmm. any incident didn't happen, of course. Uh, but um, a good a good portfolio of a course protection team uh, working in, in, in let's say a hostile environment is they haven't been attacked uh, and and that is a really good uh, thing to have in your resume that you know you haven't been attacked which means to say that you're doing all your planning you're doing all your all your work when you're on the operation all the team is switched on and everybody's doing their job correctly you know I tell you what interested me was this, the some of the uh, almost science behind spotting a threat because I haven't got a clue if I'm in a crowded room who looks like they're going to be you know about to kick off in a in a bar or a cafe or a street or something and I was asking Lee how how you spot a threat and I don't know if you want to mention one or two examples Lee of the way people behave where their adrenaline kicks in and some of the things they start but it was fascinating to me what people do just before they attack you <laughs> basically <laughs> yeah. The, the science and psychology of attack is something that I, I'm, I'm really um, heavily into, and uh, I have different psychology-based courses that, that you know, I do, um, and one for the United Nations. So uh, a lot of a lot of attacks can can be um, avoided uh, if if the operators understand how an attack works. But 
But essentially, uh, what Howard's referring to there is, say, for example, somebody is in somewhere, it could be a bar, it could be a, a public place, it could be anywhere, and they have an agenda on their mind that they're going to do something, something's going to happen, then that person will be leaking signs, and, and it's generally a slow or fast adrenaline release, which causes, uh, it manifests in, in, in physical things that they do. So the the, the key to this, and it, uh, you know, for these uh, close uh, circuit TV uh, operators and, and, and policemen and, and people like this, if they've been trained correctly and they're looking for these signs of slow release of adrenaline or, or, or quick release of adrenaline, then all of a sudden now you can start funneling suspects in a crowd even. I mean, we've got cameras now that can do this and pick it up on eye retina, as you probably know. But um, it, it's, it's looking at these signs and, and making the decision, is this person showing signs that they, they are either planning their attack or are going to commence an attack? And the answer's always got to be yes. That's the signs, I've seen the signs, I've looked at the signs, this could happen, and then you take appropriate action to either move out of the way or close that person down to allow you to move out of the way. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and when there's a lot of people, some people who are in the crowds are just generally showing signs of this because they're so ex super excited. So you, it's, it, you've got to manage it, and that's where experience comes in, I guess. Yeah, wasn't it things like... Um repetition of tapping away on phones and things like that that was a you know because they don't have to do with their hands yeah. and things and they're just psyching themselves up ready to do something so they, they play yeah. with something in front of them and i was fascinated by that because that never would have been a sign that i would have ever have, um, spotted obviously not being trained or yes it's a small signs and then as it escalates you can see the escalation right down to the just before the attack and if you can read it right, you can you can avoid the attack. Any any person could, even if you're out with your wife, you're in a bar or something like this. But what you, but the secret is, you've got to take um, your uh, your alpha male, or you've got to take your testosterone, or we, I call it a chimp. Uh, I do a lot of uh, study with uh, Professor Steve Peters and the, and the chimp paradox. Mm. So we kind of call it the chimp on your shoulder that's telling you all this bad stuff. Uh, and what you've got to do is, if, if you're in this, this situation with your wife or a loved one, if this chimp takes control of you, 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 can lo you, you lose it. So you've got to be very professional and you've got to be in control of the escalation of violence rather than reactive to it. So you've got to be proactive and it's very easy to get off that ladder, ladder once you understand the principles. So that's what I, you know, I teach this all over the world, which you know, I'm, I'm a really big fan of this, avoiding the attack rather than confronting it. Well, it's interesting. Do you, do you think that um, it would help prevent a lot of things if people were more aware of that? I do, absolutely. I think, I think what we're doing now is we're, trying to, we're closing the door. The, whole, the horse is gone. And, we're, and, and what we need to do is start looking not at... Not at how, how much security we can beef up our places, how much... We've got to start looking at, right, who's, who's likely to do this? Who are we looking for? And, and we need to be really looking at who's coming into these, these venues. What signs are we looking for? Let's, let's see them on the way in. Let's see them in the outer perimeter of the, of the security cause. Don't wait till they're inside and they go. And I think if this was taught more to the grassroots security people in our, in our societies. The people who go, they're low paid, they're unsung heroes, but there are, there are, are outside, you know, defences. I think these, these, uh, these people who do an amazing job just need more training on, on what to look for. And I, th I think, you know, we could live in safer communities, which is what we all want, right? Yeah, I think if we, if we just kept the Canadians at bay... Yes. I think things would be good, because we know they are, they've got to be the most aggressive, violent. I, I hear they're planning, to, they're planning to invade, aren't they? From what I understand. Yeah, all the time. That's all, that's all they think about. You, you need you know. more guns in America, obviously. So <laughs> can get some beer. <laughs> I, I was serving in, uh, in, um, during the Cold War in Germany, and we got on this huge exercise. The American paratroopers were, the, the, uh, the Screaming Eagles were there. I worked with them for quite a few weeks. And there was an, a, a Canadian 
battalion. I think they're called, excuse me if I'm wrong, if anybody Canadian is listening to that, I think they were called the Vandus, and they were French-speaking Canadians. <laughs> and there was a regiment of these guys, and this one night they decided to go into town and, and drink, and I have never seen such a violent bunch of men. <laughs> And, 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 and I looked and I went, oh, my God, I would hate to face them in battle. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm sure they say sorry all the time. So. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. While they're killing so, you. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, they have it written on the bullet. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm terrible. Um, so, so tell us, uh, but in, in this kind of a, a world you've lived in your whole life, in this kind of a... A business, I guess. I, I hate to use that word, but this kind yeah. of profession, I guess. Um, yeah. What What do you think the the most difficult thing for you to face was? I'm torn between uh, between Libya and Somalia, really, on, on the most difficult thing. I think Somalia was extremely challenging. Um, some of the aspects in Libya were were, were extremely challenging, but I think. I think, although it doesn't get me at the time, when I, when I look at ref, on, on reflection and I look why quite a few guys I've worked with have kind of broke down um, in certain circumstances, is that imagine this, gents, that you, you're in a foreign country and nobody knows you're there. You have no backup. You have n nowhere to go. And you're, you're ferrying around uh, diplomats. Um, or, or, or people from you know, quite high, high up uh, NGOs, and you know that if you get into trouble, there is no one coming to save you. There is nothing, and and I think managing that and operating at the highest level takes uh, takes a lot of concentration, and and I think I think just the general feeling of, of feeling. That this is it. The, the 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 decision I make now could mean whether we get home or not, and that is a massive uh, pressure. Um, especially if you know when I go away, I generally lead teams. You know, we had a stack of specific examples of the kind of thing that Lee has explained, and I can remember them all. They were incredible stories. But um, one that really stuck out to me was when he's on a rooftop um, in Libya. And uh, he suddenly realises that the guy responsible for ordering the ammo hasn't ordered enough ammo, nothing like enough. He's on, there, he's on this roof with a few friends, and it looks like Al-Qaeda are closing in. And they genuinely had a conversation, ladies' mates, about who was going to shoot who to avoid capture and torture and ultimate execution. And, and when you're having a chat like that, like, well, you, you know, you've got to shoot me. No, 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 you shoot me because I don't want to be last. <laughs> I think that's that's pretty hair raising. What do you think about most of the Netflix and movies and things like that? And we see like these agents and bodyguards and all these people protecting different people and stuff, and that you know they all are whatever really good at everything. Yeah. Uh, what what what's what's realistic and what's not about what we see in general? I, th I think I think the realism is that it doesn't actually happen in real life. But but it's what people perceive. So you know, I get that, and I and I, I'm, I'm pretty good at watching these kind of things. I, I just get stuck in and watch, and, and and I just enjoy them. But um, I think I think the the thought that uh, that a bodyguard is this um, is this sort of like double O seven uh, guy that can do everything. It, it's just not the case, and we're, we're really big on you know on team effort and. Uh, and the actual bodyguards you see, sometimes there might be 50 operators around them. So they're, they're the kind of glory boys or the glory girls that get, you know, that, that get on the TV and all the rest of it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I think actually in real life, it, it is a, a lot more boring. There's, there's lots of times when you're doing nothing. Lots of times when you're, you're preparing uh, missions uh, and you're on your computer, and you're and you, you, you're getting everybody bloods and, and and medical documentation together, and so it, it can be quite mundane. But 
Uh, I suppose people just remember the, thi the, the, the incidents where things have gone wrong and things people have either died or people have been saved and, and it's those glory moments that just hit hit the public's attention really. Not the, not the millions and millions of operations that have gone safely. Well, Lee, how, how do you deal, uh, as you're saying that, with going from like zero to 60 um, in a situation where everything is calm and then like all hell breaks loose? And, and, and how, how do you deal with the stress in that, in that situation? That, that is a great question. So, so this is the deal. If, if you do your job right, what, what you can do is, is you, from various information coming in, you can build a picture up of what is likely to happen. And all the time you're assessing things, and then hopefully what you're going to do is, is when an incident happens, you're going to see all the indicators falling into place, or your men are. And I say, when I say men, I mean, I mean your team, females or, or males. And all of a sudden, you, you, you start coordinating as a team leader and you start seeing this picture of what could possibly happen. And at that moment in time, it's down to the team leaders to go, right, stop, we're leaving now. And, and I've done this so many times. So, you know, you just get the, 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 the VIP or client and you just go, we're leaving now and off you go. And, and this is in more hostile environments. So um, it's 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 having it's having the confidence to, to to pull those missions at the right time, just before you know something's going wrong, and I, and I've been in uh, in operations where we I pull my team out, uh, and, and we've gone, and then and there's been a, a hit on the bar or the coffee place, and there's been you know a lot of people killed, you know unfortunately God bless them all, so it's it's just having that uh, a bit of luck as well. I must admit, you know, and I say a bit of luck, mm. you make your own luck, and I, and I get that as well. So a bit of luck, a bit of pre-planning, um, and, and really getting in tune with the environment and what's happening rather than getting in tune with what you're, you're doing. Uh, how can I say? You need to stand back and not work in the environment, but work on the environment and, and look around and see what's happening. And that's, that's kind of what I'm really good at. So, so basically, you know, when, I, when I'm watching TV and I'm watching the Equalizer and Queen Latifah walks into a bar <laughs> and she eyes down everyone and then she takes out ten men in, in a matter of five minutes and doesn't even break a nail, okay? So can you teach me to do that? It, it depends how long your nails are first. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got long nails, brother, I, the good answer. I can't teach you. But, um, okay. yeah, a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of people are, 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 are quite highly trained in, in martial arts and all the rest of it. Not many at all. I, I'm an eighth done. I've done martial arts. At, you know, I've competed at international level. It's my bag. It's my sport. I love it as a sport. Uh, I just happen to be able to do that kind of stuff. But it's not necessary, but it is a equalizer, shall we say. <laughs> see, you see, Howard, <laughs> now you've got the perfect drinking buddy now when you're going out. <laughs> no, I'm, really, I'm really yeah. looking forward to Bloody Scotland, the festival in Stirling. So I feel, for once in my life, I'll feel like I might be actually <laughs> quite safe <laughs> in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just wish yeah, I'd met this fellow um, when I was at school, you know, like this morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can walk in and say anything to anybody and say, oh, yeah, yeah and then stand behind him and you've got it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But, you know, I, we joke about it, but, yeah, Lee, one of the chapters <laughs> that really, I was really fascinated by quite early on in the book, it was we covered, after the Diana stuff, we covered Lee's early life. And, um, you know, I was quite surprised to learn that he was bullied as a kid, you know, and um, eventually... <laughs> I suppose, flipped out and, and hit back. But, uh, you know, you just assume that someone with Lee's life and his background and all the martial arts he developed later probably came in from from a from a tough boy, you know, tough guy background. And uh, But, yeah, he was a victim of bullying at school as well. And, uh, yeah, um, I, was, I was quite interested to learn that, really. I don't think anyone bullies him these days, of course. <laughs> no, that's what Dave's for. That's what he's... Yeah, no, that's right. so, <laughs> so, listen... Uh, you mustn't have had to do too much work when you were doing Sylvester Stallone because he's, he's pretty big. Um, what, what was the uh, hardest person that you've had to deal with? Like, I guess you don't really want to say the names, do you? But, no. I mean, um, but is there, is there a difficult client sometimes without getting names? 
Oh, the, the, oh, you get the most ridiculous stuff. Uh, with the celebs, I'm, it's not my bag. Uh, and, you know, it, I'd rather... I'd rather not do, you know, it's a bit too challenging sometimes. And uh, But um, I've worked with some extremely challenging people. And, and here's the thing as well, you know, if if you're doing, I, I kind of get on with everybody. And and if I'm away somewhere and we have a challenging client, my, my thought process, and I, and I tell my team this, and I say, look, we've signed up to, to, do, to do our work here and, and do this, this, and this. If I'd have told you before you come on the contract that you have one challenging client, would you have taken the contract? And everybody said, oh, of course I would. I said, right, so don't bitch about it. How are we going to win this client on side? You know, we're taking the money to do the contract. We're all professional. This is not about our egos. We're here to do a, a job and keep these people safe. You know, how dare you have an opinion on this person? Let's, 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 we'll bend. We'll get to know them. We'll get them on side. We'll have a great. We'll have a great contract. We'll keep them safe, and, and we'll walk away. So that's that's my way of doing it. The other way is confrontation <laughs> with with the client, and I see it all the time, and 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 it, and it breaks my heart sometimes because some great operators let their ego get in the way of doing their job, and uh, and I'm quite good at being you know, able to separate that and just. Walk away with the money in my pocket, having done a great job, and off I go to the highlands of Scotland, sit on the beach, have a a dram of whiskey, and world the world is good. <laughs> wow! So, how has this been for you, uh, living this kind of life? Like when you look back at this now, um, what 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 do you think about your life? Are are you, are you happy? Or you're like what, what's the overall Fuck. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I've, had a, I've had a full life, I've done a lot of things, and I think now, the, some of the things that I'm doing now, uh, I've, I've got a, a PTSD for veterans uh, course that we're, we're running out after the summer here, which is super exciting, we're using martial arts as a medium to help them overcome, you know, various things, so I'm super excited to... Uh, give back to the military community, and we're going to try and roll it out to the uh, emergency services in, in time. So it's nice to be able to do that, and also um, get involved. Uh, I work closely with a, a big American company, uh, and uh, I do various um, contracts for them, and we're doing a very exciting project in Europe with them. So it's, it's nice for me to be able to pull in all my experience and all my contacts to, you know, to get things moving. And it's a, it's a different time of life now. I'm going over to the States to do a, a presentation at a big uh, security conference meeting. And I've always thought about, would I ever be able to go and speak here? And I was asked, I was invited to speak a couple of weeks ago. So I'm thinking, wow, things are are changing now. I can start contributing and commenting on things and hopefully make a difference to the safety of, of the countries w that we work in. At the end of the day, someone picks up your new book and takes it home and reads it. Um, what is it that you hope they take away from the book? I, I think for me, it's, it's been very difficult to, to, to think about this, but I think for me, is, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a working class guy from a working class background and you know, I was, a, I was a bit crazy when I was young, and I've done some, done some crazy stuff. But I think with the martial arts that I got involved in, I think I'd like people to read the book and think, you know, I found this, this massive uh, influence in my life, and it's been martial arts. And I'm thinking if you've got kids out there or young people out there who are suffering from uh, any mental issues, you know, the kids out there, are, you know, with COVID and all the rest of it, they're really suffering. And there's some amazing martial arts schools out there. And then you can check them out and you can check, but, you know, if you want to give your kid a chance of getting a bit of, you know, increasing their self-esteem, getting more confident about themselves, it's a great sport to get kids into. And I think if it just... Saves a few lives by getting kids into martial arts. I think that's me. I've done my job. And Howard, how has this changed you as a writer? Do you think? Um, I think uh, it was well. It was a wonderful experience to, to tap into a life that you know I'm literally dipping my toe into because I'd never 
I've never been able to experience anything like this. And, and if I had tried to experience it, I probably wouldn't have survived if I'd had a kind of <laughs> life like these, that's for sure. Um, so I got to um, experience everything that they had gone through from a distance, and it was fascinating. It was really interesting. And I started to look at um, the world around me slightly differently, I suppose, in a way. It's not that anything's kind of rubbed off on me, but it's just the way that Lee has of explaining situations and how he's very calm without an ego. And, you know, I, I think we can all be a little bit rash, particularly when we're young, if something kicks off in a pub or whatever, or someone, I, 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 I hate bullies. If somebody verbally gave me a bit of hassle when I was younger, I tended not to walk away from that, and that was probably pretty foolish. And uh, I think um, Lee's attitude, which is to de-escalate things and avoid confrontation and be calm and fairly sort of laid back about it all um, as a person, has kind of rubbed off on me a bit, at least I hope it has. Um, as a writer, it's been fascinating to write a book that I, I didn't have to dream a plot up. I wasn't writing fiction, which is what I normally do. I normally write crime fiction. And it was a joy to be able to just kind of sit down and write. You know the ending of the story. He's still here. Um, he's had a fascinating life. It was great to put some structure on it. And, um, and we had some really interesting chats. And it was always a joy and a pleasure to talk to Lee and come away thinking, wow, that was really interesting stuff. And I, I, then it was my job just to turn it into a bit of a structured book with a bit of, um, you know, turn a conversation into English, I suppose, in a sense that, you can read like a book rather than just listen to it like a podcast. So as a writer, that was the challenge. But honestly, he had so many great stories. I was going to say that, but as a writer, uh, especially crime fiction and stuff, this must give you a totally different perspective in your approach, like the next book you write. This would, this would add something to it that you didn't have before. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I had, um, I've written a book called The Inheritance, which is due out uh, in a month in the UK. And, I ended up uh, with a character who had a bit of a military background, didn't it? And as I was writing bits of him, I think I was subliminally a little bit influenced by Lee's stuff. I didn't have... It's not that I really... I didn't nick any of his stories, I should stress, and he didn't have the same back. <laughs> so before, Lee gets, before Lee gets on to his lawyers, you know. <laughs> but uh, but I could, I could, he was a bit calmer than he probably would have been, this character, you know, and... Uh, it was it was almost what wasn't on the page, in the back of my mind. You know, sometimes you write a character and you, you have a backstory of that character in your head, but you don't actually put much of it down on the page. But I had this, you know, image of the guy, and it was probably very different from um, if I'd written it a year or two ago, I think. So that, that probably made a difference, yeah. Yeah, I would say so. So, uh, Lee, um, how do you um, like people to interact with you, or do you? Like, do you have websites, social media? Where where do you where do where do people find Lee or do they not want to? Yes, so uh, yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn and I have a social media presence. So um, because I've got such an unusual name, it's quite easy to reach out to me. If anybody wants to, please feel free. Yeah, yeah, threaten them. Come on. Yeah, I just don't you. knock on his just don't <laughs> knock on his door. Yeah, I, you know that will end. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, and so I guess the book's going to be available everywhere. We'll have that up as well when uh, when the show airs. And, uh, you know, do you, do you have a website as well, Lee, or not yet? No, not yet, no. Uh, just social media. They say they can reach out. Uh, LinkedIn's a good one for me or, um, you know, the normal uh, Facebook. Um, I, I think uh, if people want to reach me, they'll get me there. Yeah, yeah, just, uh, you know, dial a secret number and they get a code and then yeah. – <laughs> <laughs> Go down a certain road. Like I've seen all that. So, you know, we, we can we can arrange that as well. Don't yeah, we? yeah, no <laughs> doubt, no doubt. Um, well, it's been a real pleasure, and um, you know, glad you wrote the book. I'm, I'm sure people are going to love this. So it's called Protecting Diana: A Bodyguard Story, and of course, that was Lee Sansom and Howard Linsky. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. 
I'll be back.